the, the talking points are the two or three main <coughs> parts that I want to talk about that I want you to understand is, is has to do with uh, the number of animals that you can have on your place. I'm, and part of that has to do with uh, uh, the, the quality of the grass and the production of the grass. So, number one, we'll let everybody get sit down here. So if you're going to increase your stocking rate, there's a couple things that you need to know. And holistic management, Alan Savory taught many of us how to rotationally graze the animals so you can increase your stocking rate, but the animal performance tended to suffer. Well, that's because he didn't know some of the chemistry involved, and so, and so he had a little problem with that. So, we're going to start out with how to increase the energy of the grass plant that you're willing or what you're wanting to grow. Now to do that, we're going to have a grass plant here. Too many things in my hand. Yeah, I just used it. This is why I don't like that. I need one of those ones that go around your ears. We can tie it on. <laughs> yeah, we got some bailing wire right here. <laughs> All right. Now, the reason, you know, it takes me a little while to get rolling. <laughs> when I'm explaining things because I don't know where everybody stands. But you know that you can produce more grass by fertilization. You know you can produce more grass by the way you graze and how you graze. But also increasing the energy decreases the amount of feed an animal will eat. The lower the energy of the diet, the more the animal's going to eat. An animal has the ability to overeat as much as 40%. So if you can get the energy higher in the plants that they're eating, then the amount of forages that they're going to eat will be less. Now 40% is a big deal. If you enjoy feeding lots of hay in the winter, or you enjoy running out because it's drought and you didn't have enough stored feed, that's fine, but energy will be the number one deficiency in those situations. Not protein, not minerals, not vitamins. It will be energy. You need to focus on that. All right, so what we're going to do is make some energy. Energy is made up of three mineral elements. And nobody tells you this. They tell you, well, it's sugar starches or it's corn or it's you know I, I, I don't uh, carbohydrates well this is a carbohydrate it's my carbohydrate Mark's carbohydrate <coughs> for all you chemists you know that it's more, much more complicated than that carbo carbon high hydrate a is the oxygen. All right. Now, what determines how much energy this carbohydrate has? Because glucose or sugars, starches, fats, waxes, plastics are all carbohydrates. Some of them aren't very digestible but some of them are extremely digestible. Well, carbon supplies 9,000 calories per gram. There's 454 grams in a pound for anybody who is uh, challenged with the metric system. 
hydrogen, oh by the way, diamonds don't burn. Take your wife's diamond, get your acetylene torch out and try to burn it. If you live, <laughs> you'll find out that it doesn't burn anything. It doesn't burn. That's why they also put it on drill bits. Hydrogen supplies 25,000 calories per gram. You have to have hydrogen to burn carbon, so it must be attached, as in the form of methane. Let's put some methane down here, CH4. Now you know that pure, pure hydrogen will not burn unless you have oxygen. You all know this. If you take a gasoline engine, stick a rag in the carburetor, how far are you gonna go? Not very far. You must balance the amount of carbon and hydrogen or your energy source with the amount of oxygen to burn or metabolize that fuel. So you put in the proper amount of oxygen and the end product of metabolizing in your cell or the cow or the gasoline engine, the end product is still the same, is carbon dioxide and water and heat or work done. Now this happens in the cell, the gasoline engine, it doesn't matter. A little slower in the biological system, but that's the way it is. So oxygen, you can't have all positives. Oxygen is a negative 3,125 calories per gram. Now, <clears throat> so determine whether the feed that you're feeding, whether it's hay or dry land pasture or a, a lick tub that you purchase or whatever, you need to determine if it has a lot of hydrogen. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, there's two ways you can do it. Uh, one way is you can actually, there is a laboratory services that actually test for the amount of hydrogen in something. It has carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. I have one of those devices. But there are other laboratories that do it, uh, mostly pharmaceutical companies and, and universities. Some universities have them. And they will test and tell you the percent of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen in that substance. Well, another way you could do it is in regular laboratory services, they tell you the amount of sugars, starches, and fats. Well, if you look in a, a little chemistry book, you'll see that sugars are not very many carbons, starches are a few more carbons, fibers are a few more, and fats are big molecules with lots, lots of carbon and lots of hydrogen. So the higher the fat content, the higher the energy. Okay, so it's, it's very, that's another way that you can determine. So if you buy a high energy supplement from somebody and it's 2% fat, you pass it by because it doesn't got very much energy. You need to have somewhere around 4 to 5% to be called high energy. All right. Now, the reason I told you that about the oxygen is because if you are going to balance a ration and you don't want certain problems to occur like acidosis. Now you guys all know what acidosis is. You feed grain, you get long toenails and stiff sore animals and they can't walk very good or collect horses or whatever. Well that's caused by an accumulation of lactic acid in the muscle tissue. And that's caused by a diet high in, what, corn, okay? Or starches and sugars. And if you look at an analysis of corn, you will find that the oxygen content, which needs to be 40 and a half percent of its of, of, on a dry matter basis, the amount of oxygen in the diet should be 40 and a half. You'll find that corn will run 46 percent. 
And you all know that corn, if you feed a whole bunch of corn, they'll founder and die on you. And this is the reason. Well, you could also say it's high in starch and sugars, which is the same, really the same thing. All right, now if you fed an animal nothing but uh, grass, green grass, you never get acidosis and founder. And it'll run usually about 37%. So that's why you never get it. But the reason I put that up there is because sometimes grass can have a high oxygen. You've heard of, of high sugar grasses that you want to plant or, or uh, a certain time of the year where you'll get a grass founder on a horse or, or you get a little uh, uh, manure that that when it dries out gets a white color, a white looks like somebody powder, baby powder. That's acidosis. And then you didn't feed them any grain and it wasn't, the plant <coughs> didn't go to seed heads, but you still got this, this acid uh, layer on this manure pile. Well, what happens is <coughs> a grass plant takes carbon dioxide out of the air and it is absorbed into the plant through little pores called stomata. And water then is taken up by the plant <coughs> and through photosynthesis breaks the bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen, releases the oxygen out here into the air for us to breathe, absorb this carbon dioxide, and makes my glucose, my carbohydrates. Okay? <coughs> so this is the manufacturing of your sugars. Well, this grass plant, by the way, if it's, uh, we're, we're just in the spring, and let's say we're out here on this wheat pasture, <coughs> and it's nice sunny days, the hydrogen content or the energy content is going to be much higher or sugar content is going to be much higher in this top part of this plant and if you put that animal out on that pasture you're going to see that they don't go up and eat this plant down here and then go over to the next plant and eat it all the way down they don't do that when they go out there they just take a bite and then a bite and a bite and they keep on going so they're eating the top third, top half, or top part of what that grass plant's there. This is where the most energy is, or the higher sugars are, and it's possible to get an acidosis effect in those situations. Now, as that grass plant matures, more of these sugars are now turned to starches, and then to fats and cellulose and hemicellulose and so forth. And as it matures, these carbohydrates are more complex and then they don't break down as fast and then you don't get this white powdered manure. It's an interesting thing to watch. Now, if you've got a lot of cloudy weather, what happens to your sugar levels? They go down. What happens at night? The energy goes down. Another part of this is now I'm going to make myself a protein. I put my carbohydrate back up here. Now the only thing difference between a carbohydrate and a protein is this. That's it. So a protein is a carbohydrate or a source of energy with an amine group or ammonia stuck on the end. So all the differences. So one thing that you should notice because of this is when you feed protein 
Does the animal use that protein for energy or does it use it for protein? Who do you know? It just makes you feel good that you're feeding some protein and the animal looks better. Well, did they need the energy or did they need the protein? Well, there's ways to check that out and I'll, I will get to those. But we're talking about this grass plant now first. So if I want some, uh, if I'm going to make some protein, the air is 78% nitrogen and the nitrogen doesn't get absorbed into the plant that way. If it did, we would never need fertilizer because the air is 78% nitrogen. So the nitrogen has to be fixed into the soil in some, with another element or elements. <laughs> Nitrate is one of those. And usually potassium is what does the transporting of the nitrate up into the plant. Okay? You don't get proteins that suddenly produced in just because it gets into the into the system. It has to be combined with this carbohydrate to change this nitrate into a true protein. Well what happens if we have cloudy weather and this is not occurring? But does that nitrate just kind of hide down there? No. It, it still is up in here, up into the grass plant, but it's in a, in a form that's not a true protein. And it's a little bit dangerous uh, uh, to be grazing this grass plant real low because the lower part is going to be where the higher amount of nitrate is going to be. Okay. Uh, are you all familiar with nitrate poisoning? Okay, uh, just in case. You know. uh, what occurs in nitrate poisoning? I'll show you what happens. In the rumen of the animal, this nitrate because this is a this rumen is a is a fermentation vat and you're going to produce alcohols and you're going to, and it's going to be a slightly acid environment so you're going to have some hydrogen ions floating around and so this nitrate is going to hook on to a bunch of those hydrogens and make ammonia it might be an ammonium ion, NH4, okay? Now the problem with that is, is that ammonia now is causing this system to be alkaline. So it's going to depress the growth and multiplication of the, of the critters in there. But in nitrate poisoning, if you don't have enough, if you don't have enough hydrogen, I better, the right color. That's a bloodstream. You, you, you see I was very good at, at uh, drawing. Alright, this ammonia is going to go right in to the bloodstream and it's going to combine with the red blood cell and it's going to be called methemoglobin. Okay, now the methemoglobin, here's my ammonia, the, the hemoglobin is supposed to pick up carbon dioxide from the, from the cell and it's supposed to transport it to the lungs to eliminate the carbon dioxide and to take in oxygen. But if we have the hemoglobin combined with nitrogen, as in blood urea nitrogen, now this carbon dioxide doesn't get transported here and the oxygen doesn't get transported here. So if there's a lot of it, what happens to here? The animal falls over dead from nitrate poisoning. You can do this experiment if you wish. And you don't have to use nitrates. You can use urea because here's what urea looks like.
there's a molecule of urea. What you do is you go get the highest price animal you've got on the place. It's important to use the best animal you have. Very, very important. And you get a big handful of that urea and you shove it in that animal's mouth and then let it get a drink. And it'll take about 10 steps and fall over dead. Okay, then cut the animal's throat. And look at the color of the blood. It'll be chocolate colored or very dark, proving that you couldn't take up oxygen. So the animal suffocated. So that's what happens with nitrate poisoning. It also happens with urea poisoning. It also happens when you're feeding lush grass or high protein feeds. Let's, let's, let's uh, feed the horses nothing but pure alfalfa. Boy, that's a really good thing to do. How, or how about uh, uh, a 20% protein mix for your cows? Or how about lush green pasture that you fertilized that's, uh, that doesn't have nitrate but has lots of protein because we like lots of protein because that's a good thing. Well, if the bacteria in the rumen require more energy on a protein, and they don't require protein, they will deaminize that protein and release this ammonia as a gas. So on a high protein diet, we'll do the same thing as nitrates or urea. And it tends to clog up the liver and the kidneys down here. That's where it's supposed to be gotten rid of. And <clears throat> reduces the oxygen uptake and the carbon dioxide transfer. So here in the middle of the, in the summer when it gets hot and oxygen molecules get farther apart, you have an animal standing around under a tree going and you say it's because they're, they're the wrong animal for the area or they don't fit or we got the wrong, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, it's too hot. It's too humid. It's too sun. Maybe it's none of those things. Maybe you are feeding the animal incorrectly and this has become a problem. Okay. So don't use protein for your energy sources. All right, we've got to get back to making this energy in this plant because I kind of got off the subject. This is the end result of using protein for an energy source or harvesting the grass plant too early and ended up with a lot of nitrogen and not very much energy. The lower the energy in this plant, you can, you can understand this. If you've got animals that are out on corn stalks and nothing else, the manure piles stack up about the size of a Christmas tree. You can't drive over them when it's frozen out. In a four-wheel drive, you get stuck. Well, if you give them some protein, the manure pile goes down, doesn't it? If you give them some energy, let's say corn or something, the manure pile goes down. Now, what is it that they require? Was it the protein or was it the energy? Well, in corn stalks, it might have been both. But you need to know which. All right. Now, if, do I, any questions? Please, if you, if you have a question because I'm going over stuff too, but just ask. And we'll go off on another tangent on something else. Yes, sir. I suspect a lot of people, because they've been told to supplement protein when they need energy, and therefore they're paying for extra stuff that may be causing problems? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what I was trying to get to, but I... Oh, we're getting there. Hey, Mark. Mark. Yes. Um, if you remember about where I live, down south, they are down there. In the Bible, friendly fish. If you're familiar with the with the plants. Yes. Okay. And 
But I don't know what it is. Of course, it's been green for quite a while for me, for a month and a half it's been green, okay, at least some. But this time of year, we'll get those cold deals and they have green, green vegetation of all different kinds. Of course, my cattle graze year round. You get a real cold temperature, it's got to be down 20 and below. And the next day, they're a dead cow. That's right. Yeah, now, that's sometimes, true. she'll lay there and make a mark. And sometimes there's not, she didn't even wait. Now, I know she's eating something, but is there anything particular she did? I've identified 36 species of grass and sedges and forbs of all kinds. And there, at this time of year, back before now, there's no choke cherries bleached out, nothing like that, that she'd get across the gases. Do you have any idea for me? Sure. I know, I know exactly what it is. Thank you. Tell me. <laughs> By the way, prussic acid hydrogen cyanide and nitrate poisoning or, and urea poisoning are all the same species. They're all carbon uh, 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 hydrogen cyanide is just HCN. Prussic acid is the same thing. That is prussic acid. Okay, if you put a little energy, excuse me, I don't right. if, you, if you put a little uh, uh, hydrogen to it, you end up Started, starting to make a, a, a nitrate. So you're going to go to uh, three eventually. Yeah, All right, so, so what his problem is, it's in the spring. And here we are in the spring. And we're taking up carbon dioxide, and we got plenty of moisture, but we didn't have much. You guys got some cloudy weather. Or let's say that it wasn't cloudy, and let's say uh, everything was working pretty good, and and this has taken nitrogen up in here in the form mostly of nitrate, and it got down to 20 degrees. Is this plant going to transport this nitrogen? No. It's not going to happen. It's kind of frozen in place. It's kind of stuck right there. So when that occurs, photosynthesis isn't going to happen either. And it's also at night when you don't have any sunlight to make your sugars and starches and your fats. So, so this nitrate stays right here. And especially if you raised a little lower or forced them in one paddock to eat a little lower, it's going to be more of a problem. So at night is when your problem occurred. Just before sun, uh, sunrise is probably when they all... I've had it happen in the mid-morning, but always the day after the cold, cold night. Right, because the accumulation of nitrogen in the plant is too high. So you want to know what to do about it. You have to raise the energy of the plant. Well, how do you do that? Well, we have no control over the amount of sunshine. So that means that you're going to have to move that animal to a place where there is less uh, nitrogen accumulation in the plants. High ground. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, know, I know the problem. I got plenty of high ground and plenty of low ground in there. Ain't nothing I can do about it. You got, you got the same problem up in the high, high area with those nitrates? Uh, well, it changes 300 feet, changes 300 feet in elevation and 200 feet sideways, time and time and time again. That's, that's, that's what, I, what I'm trying to get at. Not on the creek bottom. I don't have. I never had this problem on the creek bottom. Really? Never. On the creek problems, you. I don't really? have that problem. Different species on the creek bottom. Well, <laughs> those plants. You know, what an animal goes after, the natural instinct for an animal is to eat the highest energy feeds that it can. Okay. 
And if the highest energy happens to have extra protein, well, that's what they're going to eat. So you're going to have to find a way to increase the energy or change their diet to a higher energy species with less nitrogen. You don't want to walk them up and feed them hay. Well, you might have to do that, but you could feed the hay out there on it as long as the hay you're feeding has, has more energy than the undesirable plant. I could feed millet hay or grass hay or whatever. Well, you might have to. But after it's got enough sunshine and after it's warmed up, it's never a problem. You have a well, right, in the immediate, in the short term. Right? When it, but but it, it'll happen over several <coughs> weeks. Period oh, of time. yes. There'll be one here. And oh, yes. It's all about nitrate. High producers, high producers, and it's not milk beer. Cut their throat, look at the color of the blood. Two days later, I find them, it's still going to be the same color? Yeah, it'll be, it won't flow then, no. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Okay, so I, I want to get back to this n nitrate thing here. <clears throat> One thing about uh, uh, there's many plants in the world that don't don't take up a lot of nitrogen, and and fertilization programs are very beneficial if you want to produce that. There's only a problem with that is is when we're growing this grass plant, it also needs certain minerals taken up okay it needs some magnesium and it needs some calcium and it needs some phosphorus and it needs some sodium and it will get some potassium it's, if it's there the problem is is we think we know what that plant needs well we can make the plant have a high volume and a high nitrogen content but the balance of the minerals in it and the energy to protein ratios are never correct I and mean, it makes it good if you're selling hay but if you're using it for your own animals there's a bit of a problem okay so one of the points of increasing the energy of this grass plant is getting the right proportion of minerals in this grass plant for it to make the most energy or the most hydrogen or the most fat content and to do that you have to know which minerals to use well i don't think anybody knows but the plant knows and here's how it does it there are millions of organisms in the soil there is bacteria protozoa and uh, nematodes and worms and all kinds of bugs and they're necessary for the breakdown of the minerals that are in the soil to make it available for the plant to take up so <clears throat> did you also know that there is a, a bacterium that live in the in the soil and it's not associated with with any kind of a plant called the zotobacter. There's probably a hundred different species of a zotobacter, and what they do is they, they eat grass, just like the cow does, and they get their nitrogen source from the air. So all the nitrogen you ever require is available if you have this zotobacter living in your soil. Now you have it in your soil, it's just that you don't feed it. And you know why I, don't, I know you don't feed it? It's because when you graze, you, you eat everything off. Maybe not entirely in the springtime, but before fall, there's nothing left out there. You didn't feed the bacteria. You didn't feed the worms. Now bacteria don't like sunlight. It nukes them. 
it dries it out, dries the soil out too. So if you don't have any food source, grass plants laying down here, then the sunlight can get to the soil and it kills the organisms. So you don't have the bugs to, to break down the, the soil minerals to absorb into the plant so that you can make your energy. So you must have this shade, you must have this also to trap moisture, and you have to have this to feed the bacteria. Well, nobody does it. I, uh, uh, this, you all have probably uh, heard of Ian Mitchell Ennis from South Africa. And Ian, uh, this is in 97, had me stop at his place, and, uh, and I was talking to him about, about this grass plant here. And he was getting his, uh, being certified as a holistic management educator, and he had a group of his people that he was teaching over, and, and, uh, and he knew everything there was to know about grazing. And, and uh, he has this hyperennia, I forget what, it's, it's what they make the thatch roofs out of. This grass grows, you know, 20 foot tall, and when it gets that tall, it becomes a stick and nothing will eat it. His cows will go out through there and they will starve on all this grass because it's a big stick. And so what they do in South Africa, Africa is they light it up. They burn hundreds of thousands of acres of this of these sticks. Because after you burn, then you have nice lush green grass growing. And then they can get performance. Okay. So uh, you know, I, I didn't know the politics of South Africa. I only knew that that uh, if you wanted to promote that grass plant and you want it and you need to keep it in a vegetative state so that it doesn't go to seed and it doesn't become four, 40 foot tall and become a stick you have to graze it and then go to the next paddock and graze it and then go to the next paddock and graze it and just take maybe the top third or top half of the top part of the plant the reason I told him to do this is because if you graze the top half of the plant, then you have this much plant now to collect sunlight and to regrow. If you graze it down here instead of here, which one will grow back faster? Well, duh, this one because it can collect a whole bunch of sunlight. So making hay wouldn't be a very desirable thing to do, is it? Because you're cutting it down here. But if you grazed it, how much more plant material would you have? You'd have a lot more. And the energy content would be higher if they're just eating the top half. I hesitate to say the top third or the top if you watch the animal, it'll vary. Some plants that they'll consume and some of them they, they will never even touch. Now, why would that be? Well, there's something in that plant that they don't care for. I don't know what it is. Could be nitrate, could be uh, an alkaloid of some kind, hard to say. All right, so if we have this much plant now that can recover, then, and then we come across and graze again and we graze again and before this plant after this plant has recovered plus just a little more it's still in a vegetative state so you come by and graze it again but it keeps getting a little taller every time but it doesn't go to seed that's the point it's in a vegetative state so it never gets 27 foot tall and it never gets to be a stick. It 
it's always in a vegetative state. Well, I said, don't ever, 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 ever burn. Because if you burn, then there's nothing down here. There's no organic matter. There's no hay for these organisms to consume. If you burn it, then you sterilize the soil and you can't trap any moisture and there's nothing to feed the organism. And he said to me, we can't do that. And I said, why not? He said, because by the time we get back to all the thousands of hectares of land that he's got, this plant's already 20 foot tall. I can't get around. And because I knew he was arrogant and I didn't uh, like it very much, I was rude. This is a true story. I said, well, then just sell half your farm. Ooh, I didn't know that was a bad thing to say. In Africa, you sell half your farm, you will never see it again because of the political environment that they have over there. Well, this down here, this knock, all this grass that gets knocked down eventually, not all of it, but a majority of it, that right there is more important than whatever it is you do with cows. It doesn't matter what you do with a cow. The more of this you knock down here on the soil, the more you feed the organism, the more grass you're going to get, and the higher energy that grass plant will have. Very important. But nobody does it, because it's wasting. If you want to hear people about wasting, you go talk to the Amish. They, you know, they could scrape a plate clean with a with a toothpick. I mean, unbelievable. Mark? Yes. Yes. Uh, come up to my place and my maternal grandparents will order the wrong. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I mean, man. They, can, they, they don't like to waste. Yeah, you can guess it. If that happens, how long does it take for those organisms to get back in the soil? Pretty, pretty fast, but it usually <coughs> takes about three years to get it. The more that you can drop on the soil, the faster it'll be. But there's a limit because you still got to be in business of feeding some cows. It takes at least 12 years under one of black root sod to convert it to where there's something in the soil. <coughs> black root their soil is as dead as that. It depends, it, yeah. It, <coughs> one way you could do it, but it's, <coughs> You know, it, it's a, an expense is you can roll hay out and don't let them clean it up. Let them lay on some of it. Well, that's a waste. We've got to grind that hay and get them to eat every speck. No. <coughs> feeding these guys down here is more important than feeding that cow. This will give you more tons per acre let me tell you what Ian did. I didn't know it was possible. I, I told him, you could increase your cow herd two to three times. He leased out two-thirds of his land and increased his total herd by seven times. Now, is that a big deal? you damn right it's a big deal. That's where all the profit is. That's like buying a whole bunch more farms, isn't it? Well, now most of his grasses are warm season grasses because of his environment, but he is now getting some cool season plants growing that never grew before. Why are those plants growing now and some of these undesirable or less desirable by the animal are starting to grow? His high perennia is is going away. Those organisms. This, this no. sticks that are growing. Why does that occur? Because he made the environment right for other plants to grow and flourish. And this one was growing and flourishing because, because nothing would eat. 
so it took over. So all your bushes that you don't like, or your uh, larkspur up in the high cut, all those things, those things grow because uh, you're eating all the desire, the cows are desirable ones, so they get to take over. So you can do something about it. You know, learn, learn how to leave a bunch. Okay, the more you give to the soil, I'm quite biblical, isn't it? So it is. The more you give, the more you will get back. Alright, so the energy goes up, the, the, the mineral content in the plant gets more, there will be more and different species of grass growing. You will have, of course, some warm season grasses and some cool season grasses. Now, one thing about cool season grasses like fescue, if you're in fescue country and you hate fescue, uh, and I don't like fescue, in the early spring or the late fall and winter, it's a great grass. So why is it good year round? Because at 82 degrees Fahrenheit, cool season grasses stop photosynthesizing. So what happens? They quit growing. They start respiring, which means they're using energy instead of making energy. So the energy goes down in the grass plant, in that particular plant. And also in that particular one, if, if the plant is not growing and it's respiring, it, it makes conditions right for an undesirable organism to grow. And you know which one that is. That's why you get uh, uh, that fungi in there that starts growing and, and uh, produces a, uh, an alkaloid mycotoxin and kills your animals or certainly makes them sick. A lot of the my, mycotoxins you see in corn grains and beans and all those, those are because the natural antibody production in the plant is not occurring because it doesn't have everything it needs to make the antibodies required to, to make a good healthy plant material. And then you've got these meatheads that decide to, I'm sorry, I get carried away, that changes the proteins in the plant so that they can spray weed killer on them and they won't, they won't die. That ge genetically modified material is a protein that changed. Well, they change the structure, either either how the proteins fold or the, uh, the stereochemistry or whatever. I don't, that's very complicated and I don't understand it. But they changed a particular protein in that plant material so they could spray on this stuff and, uh, and it kills all everything else, but it won't kill that plant. They're doing it with alfalfa. Well, guess what? I, I was doing rations for a guy, a small herd. I don't deal with very many big outfits. And, and uh, we built a ration where they ought to gain four, four and a half pounds a day gain. We used some corn, we used some soybean meal and, uh, and a little hay and uh, whatever. And, and uh, you know, and we weigh them. And they were only gaining like two pounds a day. And I said, there's something wrong. So I went over there, because I'd done this before back in the 70s and 80s, before they in invented GMO. And, and these animals weighed about 800 pounds, but they looked beautiful. They were fat and slick and everything, but they weren't gaining any weight. Well, it takes two and a half times more energy to put on a pound of fat than it does a pound of meat. And that's what these animals were doing. So I said, why? Where's the protein? Didn't you put the soybean 
Yeah. 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 I, you know, it's a small farmer, so you can't hardly lie and watch him. And so I took a sample of the manure. Yeah, I don't know why, but I did. And I tested it, and the manure is 32% protein on a dry matter basis. Well, there was the protein. I guess that's what they call bypass now. I don't know. All I know is the rate of gain wasn't there, but the cost of gain was pretty high. So, I, I, you know, we got a problem. Well, if you're going to feed that stuff to cows, and then you, I guess you probably give So you're saying that was GMO alfalfa? No, I'm saying uh, we use grass hay and mostly a high grain ration. But they're doing it with alfalfa too now, the GMO. And it's going to change the structure of the protein, and some of those proteins are not going to be digestible. It's like, uh, it's like a lock and key system. Uh, uh, you know uh, that uh, uh, fake sugar they put in diet sodas, Sacrum. okay, saccharin, or, or aspartame. yeah, aspartame, aspartame. Aspartame is an amino acid, did you know that? And it gives a sweet taste, but it's, a, it's an amino acid. But your body looks at it and says, what, what, what do I do with this? And so uh, it has to flush it out through the liver and the kidneys. You take enough of it and your liver and kidneys will fail. You've got to be careful of that stuff because it's, it's not something... Uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, uh, Co-Rid. You all know Co-Rid for coccidiosis and calves. Well, they use an antibiotic too. Uh, but Co-Rid is a B vitamin. And, and it happens to be the stereoisomer of, of uh, vitamin B1, thiamine. Now, what that means is, is you have uh, left-handed and right-handed molecules, let's say. But they're, and, and you've got four fingers and a thumb on each hand. But when you both face them forward, they're opposite. Okay, that's an example of stereochemistry. So the protozoa have to have vitamin B1 to reproduce. So if you stick in chorid, which is a stereoisomer of vitamin B1, then, the, then they, those uh, protozoa take that up, thinking that they're gonna, you know, it's the same thing, but they can't multiply. And so they eventually, the bacteria cultures in the rumen then overcome the number of those and they all die. Well, that's what's occurring. Is we're having a lot of proteins that are not proteins that we can actually utilize. Or the cow can, or the horse, or the chicken, or whatever. And so our feed efficiencies are going to drop down. But because you're in the grass business, hopefully, then you don't really have to worry about that too much. You're in a good position right now. Okay. A any other questions? I I kind of get carried away. Uh, no. Okay. Now this grass plant has an immune system, and I talked about that. And and part of it is to keep insects off. If if the, if you have a problem, let's say with uh, alfalfa, and you get uh, leaf hoppers coming in there. That usually means that plant is sick. Something's not there. What is it? Well, they're not producing sugars properly or energy. Because you have to have energy. If you've got a calf, if you've got a bunch of calves, and you have them on a, a, a high protein, low energy diet, they're going to get sick on you. You need energy for that calf. Because you have to have fat to produce antibodies. Thin cows get sick. Fat cows, they never get sick. Oh, by the way, Ian, get, get back to the story. I, he he kind of quit talking to me, and I kind of quit talking to him. And, and uh, 
And one day I found out that he was going to be giving a talk at uh, Greg Judy's. And so I called up and I said, Greg, can I stop in? Because, uh, you know, he charges a bunch of money to have people talking. And uh, it's been three or four years since I've seen him, and I figured maybe we both got over being mad at each other. So I came into this little place, and, and he was down there with his glasses down, messing with his computer, because he likes these, these printed, these uh, computer-generated things. And I, and I came up behind him, and he was trying to figure out, I said, just push that button there. And he didn't know who it was. He says, will that work? I said, hell, I don't know, but we'll find out. And then he turned around and never been friends ever since. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, uh, but, you know, it's just, anyway. Mark? Yes? Since you brought up Ian, what about Johan Eastman? Oh, Johan, uh, I, I've never, I never met Johan until, uh, until uh, Jimmy, Jaime uh, Elizondo, uh, uh, brought him over. I had never met him. Uh, I knew Jimmy uh, when he was still owned a, uh, a cheese factory in, Tor in, uh, in Torreon, Mexico. No, not Torreon. Uh, I forget that. Hmm? No, it's down there on the coast, on the Gulf. It's, the, it's a big town. It's where they happen all the problems. <laughs> everybody's getting everybody's head cut off down there. Uh, yeah, well. Well, anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why he moved over here. But his his mom was uh, was uh, she was a professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. So he's half American, half Mexican. Well, anyway, and and he had a ranch where he was uh, grazing. Uh, cows, rotational grazing, and, and I went down there. Now, you know, all grasses are a little bit different. He had a lot of Bermuda grass, and as you know, Bermuda grass is uh, sometimes really good, but most times it's not. You know, it's a warm season grass, and, and so he's, he is, uh, you know, he, I told them different things. Well, you know, I, I may not agree with what he's doing now, but what he's doing now is working for him. So I'm not going to criticize if it's working. Uh, I, I may have done some things different, uh, but I taught him all this stuff, just like I taught Ian all this stuff. So when you hear him talking about uh, grazing, uh, uh, maybe the top half or top third, or, or uh, leaving the, the pasture grow along and some of it dropped down on the ground. That's where it came from, was uh, me telling them this uh, weird stuff. Okay, uh, any more questions about this? this? Yes, sir. Can that be accomplished by resting a pasture or is it better to graze it more often quickly? It's, it's better to graze it more often and have the animal actually not this on the ground because the bacteria can't jump up here and bite it. It has to be knocked down on the soil surface. But resting the pasture is better than nothing. Now, if it was high perennia, I'd say no, because it's going to get 40 foot tall and become trees. So now, a Bermuda grass, that seems to work really well. Uh, 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 Jimmy does that, but he also supplements the animals look unbelievably good, but he supplements because he knows Bermuda grass is very low in protein and very low in energy. Okay, well, if it works for you, okay. You know, can you do it another way? Well, maybe. Now, out here in, in, in this part of the country, not only Colorado and Kansas and Oklahoma, you have uh, cool season grasses that grow very fast, like buffalo grass. That's a great grass. But the fat content is very high in it. That's why cattle get fat on it. But they don't have that. They have a whole bunch of worm season grasses and they're terrible. They're good when they're growing, but not when they mature. Okay. 
uh, on all the ways that I might go remember something. What warm season grasses do you not like? That I don't like. like. Switch and big blue and no, and if the cow likes them, I like them. Because I, it does. It's not important whether I like the dang thing or not. I, I just got through planting some Johnson grass in Wisconsin. I didn't tell anybody. Well, I have now. <laughs> well, it's not going to spread very fast. Not because they spray it. Spray. But I don't have any warm season grasses. Because we kill them all. We hated Johnson grass. Got in the cool one. Yeah, but Big Blue will work up there. It works all the way up into Canada. Well, I didn't know about it. I just, you know, Johnson grass was there and I was there. And so that's why. Now, winter, stockpiling, you graze once or twice. Once for cool season, once for warm season, or twice for cool. Let her go back. In winter grazing, ah, you're yeah. locking it down, but the western wheatgrass, they'll take it off down to about, if it gets that tall, which in nice years it does, they take it down about that far, look like you give it a much haircut in wintertime, but they knock a lot of it down. And this is what you're talking about. That's what I'm talking about. So I do that by winter, by stockpiling, grazing year round, and stockpiling, and then... The more, I, I don't know how to say it any better. The more you leave, the better off and the more grass you'll get every year. The more that you, if you could knock it all but 10% of it down on the ground, you would be unbelievable what you see next year. Unbelievable. But nobody's going to do that because usually you got more cows than you got land. And so you're stuck. What you really need to do is, is if you can't graze the top half and knock the other half down or part of the other half down because you have too many cows, sell part of your cows. You'll be able to get them back the next year because you'll have more grass every year. Amish are very bad at this because they'll have, they'll have 40 acres 50 dairy cows, 15 calves, and uh, 8 or 10 horses or mules. And you know what a horse or a mule does? With you? There ain't no green left. They, they never get it going. They have to continually buy. The production of the land could be so much better. But anyway, now I want to talk to you about cell. This is a cell. Cell of your body, cell of a grass plant, cell of a cow. It doesn't matter, a cell. A cell is a cell is a cell. Alright? Now, what controls the osmotic pressure to keep the cell in the right structure? The osmotic pressure inside the cell is controlled by potassium. Okay. And outside the cell, the osmotic pr pressure is controlled by sodium. Did you know there was a balance between sodium and potassium? Did you know there was a balance between phosphorus and calcium on the cow? You know all these. This is just one that nobody ever told you about. Maybe. All right. And the potassium requirement for a cow, at least in the 1960s, was 0.93%. And sodium was 0.24% on a dry matter basis. That's a requirement supposedly by the NRC in 1960s. Every 10 years, they all get together and, and come to a different conclusion. And every year, every 10 years, the amounts of requirement for a particular element goes up. 
They never go down. There was only one element that ever went down, and that was selenium. Selenium was illegal to use in the 60s, except for sheep. Uh, unless you paid no attention to the government rules and did your own thing. Uh, but they said the requirement was uh, 0.1 part per million. Uh, that's uh, 0 0.000001. Huge amount. <coughs> you can see it's huge. All right. Well, then they decided it was a really good thing to feed the cows. It's really important if you want to get them bred, you gotta have selenium. So they raised it to 0 0.5 parts per million. Um, part per million. Well, at five times. They increased it five times automatically. Guess what happened? Yeah, the cows died. Oh, oh, uh, uh, somebody, it was, wasn't their fault. Pretty sure. So they changed it to 0 0.3. It's the only element that they ever raised and then came back on. Do you remember in the 60s when urea was the best thing to use on cows? Remember that? Liquid feed, all the protein, all the urea was a great thing until it killed a whole bunch of cows and now they don't like it. Remember that? Well, whatever. All right, let me get back to my, my, my real subject. All right. If you look at lush green pasture, wheat pasture, native, I don't care. Except for there are parts of the country like in the Dakotas and uh, farther west here where sodium is fairly high. But there are most parts of the country, if you check green grass, the potassium level will run somewhere between 2 to 4%. Now that's when it's lush and green growing, like you see out here in these wheat pastures. Okay, so the pasture is anywhere from two to four times the requirement of potassium. And if you've got alfalfa, you're putting potash on it, aren't you? Potassium, what for? Because potassium transports nitrogen and it gets my protein up so I can sell it to the dairyman and make more money because it's higher in protein. Really good deal, huh? As long as you're not using it yourself, you're probably okay, but okay. <clears throat> now the sodium content will be less than 0.01%. 24 times too short. Well, <coughs> the cows didn't die, did they? No, the cows didn't die. So that means you can get waste out of the cat out of the cell, but you can't get food in because of this pressure gradient problem. You know what I just described here? Have any cows in the high country or bring calves in up in the high country? Called brisket disease. There it is. This is brisket caused by a potassium excess and a sodium deficiency. And, and the calves, uh, you wean them and they, or you take them up there and they're coughing and they get lung trouble and they've got pneumonia. What do you think this fluid goes to? Well, lungs is one of them. <laughs> and the lower extremities, that's what brisket disease is. All right, so why didn't all the animals just fall over dead? Because we couldn't get any food in there but we could get waste out. Why didn't they die? Well, God was ahead of us. He figured this out before, and we call it, the chemistry students call it the sodium potassium ATP pump. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. 
the energy for the cell to reproduce and do whatever cells do, whether it's in the plant or whether it's in an animal, is this is the energy right here. So this pumps food into the cell so that it can continue on and not fall over dead. Well, if I equalize this pressure, do I not reduce the amount of energy used to just keep it in keep it alive? Of course. It's what I'm calling it's called feed efficiency. Wow. I thought that was all just like energy and protein. No. Sodium and potassium, the huge deal. ATP is the energy source of the cell. When a cell takes in carbohydrates and it takes in your sugars, starches, fats, all this stuff, it, it goes into a little, a little, well, there may be hundreds of them or thousands of them, little parts of the cell called the mitochondria. And that's where energy is produced. That's where ATP is produced. Well, <clears throat> so that we can correct these mistakes that we make by our expert knowledge of feeding grass plants, and we should let the ant bacteria do that instead of us. What's the problem here now? E. E. Triphosphate. E. Triphosphate. You know anybody that goes out and fertilizes much with phosphate? No. No, you know why? Because it's very expensive. So we can't do that. And and uh, some of the phosphates ran off into the into the river, and some the EPA guy wandered by and tested and said, "Oh, we we can't have this." They can't have this phosphorus running off into the, well, that's probably right. What form did you use? Oh, some water-soluble form. Why didn't you just let the bacteria make a phosphorus form down here that the plant could use? Now, maybe you need some phosphorus. Maybe your land doesn't have it. Or, don't forget, maybe your grass plants that you've been grazing off have a short root. And maybe if you left some of it, maybe these roots would be farther down where there's some phosphorus. That's true. All right. <clears throat> so if I want to get the sugars and starches and fats up here in this grass plant, not only do I need water and carbon dioxide and sunlight, I need some potassium and some sodium, and I need some phosphorus. But you also have to have magnesium, and you, you, know, you have to have them all. And they have to be in the right proportion. Does anybody here know what the right proportion is? No, especially me. I have no clue. I do know that when we put on an excess or we put down what we think is the proper amount. We put on, let's say, uh, 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 NPK. But what about the others? Aren't, aren't there like a hundred elements? Well, some of them are radioactive. All right, so <clears throat> uh, what about molybdenum? All right, in parts, parts of this country, we've got too much molybdenum. molybdenum. So that it causes what? A copper deficiency and our black cows go start changing color to white. And the calves don't have stomachs and... Uh, yeah. yeah, they get scours and all kinds of problems. It's all because of an excess. What I'm trying to say to you is, do not worry about being deficient in something. Worry more about what might be in excess. Because an excess of anything will cause 10 others to be unavailable. If you feed an excess 
uh, if you feed an excess of uh, uh, calcium and magnesium, you're, you're going to increase the requirement for phosphorus. You can do this. Put out all the minerals free choice and four feet some grass hay that's high, or some hay or something that has a lot of calcium and magnesium. They'll eat the snot out of the phosphorus free choice. Well, you know, what, what was wrong? What, was the free choice mineral thing wrong? No. You guys caused a problem by knowing more than the cow. Guess what? The cow knew more than we did. Okay. So what is it in the solar brain? Is it, is it high in potassium or high in what's a high, high causing imbalance here for PS question? The distillers, the distillers grains, they, they say that it's high in phosphorus. That's what they warn you about. Uh, oh, so that, that causes a deficiency in potassium? Uh, no, uh, an excess of phosphorus will cause zinc. I'm sorry? It will cause zinc deficiency. Well, uh, sure, because uh, uh, tomorrow, I, I don't bring any, I don't talk about what I do, okay? And, but tomorrow, uh, if you uh, stop me, I have uh, uh, booklets where in the back it talks about the function of elements and what happens if you have an excess or deficiency of a particular element. And it can be very helpful. The, the front half of the book is... Propaganda, the second half is really good information. So you can tear out the back and throw the real, I don't care. Okay. Uh, kind of got off. Uh, where the, where, why, why did you say you had a, uh, wondered about, uh, about, uh, well, I just knew that the, Feeding some dry distillers to some calves this went this winter for protein source, and they said it. I couldn't remember what they said. I needed a special mineral because it might cause it a. It had an overabundance of potassium and phosphorus. Sulfur, sulfur is what it, it might, be it sulfur. Be sulfur. It might be. Sulfur. It's it's too so much sulfur. That would cause a problem. So I had to feed a high potassium or high something mineral. I had a special mineral that I was supposed to feed. I see. So that's what I don't. The, question was. The, the reason I can't tell you exactly. Is because every one of those distilling outfits have a different method, and they have, and it's different. The the the, the fat contents are different. The you know they take out all the starches and sugars. ADM and Cargill they take all the fats out, but the others they haven't figured that out yet. That the fats were a really good thing, and so you guys get to use it. But once they figure it out then don't bother buying it because it's useless. Not only is it protein from GMO that about a third to a half is not available, there's no energy in it. So be a little careful with that. And How about a little we'll sunflower it. meal? Will that help? Well, sure. Depends on if they took all the fat out, you know. Depends on if you need protein or not. Yes, sir? So the hay around me is going to round up ready. So should I be asking specifically, and it should be priced differently if I'm buying hay? If I have to buy hay, I don't. I would. Okay. And corn stalks, a, a Roundup Ready field versus a non. Well, it, it, the corn stalks, the corn stalks, uh, it, uh, it's going to be in the proteins, not in the, not in the starches so or the, the sugars. Huh? In the corn. It's not going to be. You, you can still use the corn for energy, you just can't use very much of the protein. It's in the protein that, that the problem has occurred. You don't buy corn for protein, you buy it for energy. The sugars and starches, no problem. But the alfalfa and the soybean meal, you buy that for the protein. Well, if a, if a third of it's not available, well, they don't know that. But that's what's happening. I have two daughters that have PhDs in biochemistry. Okay, they're way smarter than I am. I, I can't even understand half the words they say. And and my oldest daughter, uh, was, I don't know, at Uni University of Kentucky, and she called me one day and she said, Dad, do you know who Monsanto is? I said, yeah. 
they, they make the roundup. And she said, well, I thought you'd like to know that they're trying to hire a protein chemist. That's all she said. Now, protein chemists are unbelievably focused. It's, it's you know, I can't even, I have no way to tell you what you need to look for. It's unbelievably complex. I know nothing about it. But that's all she had to tell me. Because I knew that the protein wasn't as available. It was bypassing. I guess if you like bypass, it's a good thing. Because that's what it's going to do. Okay? Now, uh, I want to come back to this ATP part. And, and if you need to get going, or I don't even know what time it is. Am I talking too long or boring too many people? It's not. 8.30? Oh, we've only been doing an hour and a half. Um, an hour and 26 minutes. Hour, <laughs> you know that? that? Okay, I understand. I understand. I want to talk about another subject that also has to do with this same thing. And the reason I want to talk about it, because it, 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 it it's all related. And that's cancer. When I went to school, I, uh, you know, I only took the courses I wanted to take, <laughs> you know, like, uh, so uh, I'm heavy on chemistry and biology and bacteriology and all that stuff. Well, I had to do this uh, in-depth uh, thesis on something, and I did it on cell energy. Okay, well, it makes sense. That's well, what I've been talking about. And and uh, the more you know, you have to get very in depth, and you have to use all the articles and all the unbelievable. I had to go to Iowa City to the their library, use the university. Anyway, I found out that uh, Dr. Otto Warburg back in. I don't know, the 20s or something, or earlier, discovered that a cancer cell is a cell that's undergoing anaerobic respiration, which means fermentation. It means it will not allow oxygen into the cell to complete the metabolism of the cell. Well, the same thing can happen in any plant or animal. Okay, so if you can't get, by the way, calcium is what transports oxygen into the cell. Well, something is blocking it. Now, a cancer cell is a normal you know, liver cell or whatever kind of cell that gets the cancer. It's just a normal cell, but it, it doesn't know how to turn off. It just keeps reproducing and reproducing. And the end product of fermentation is lactic acid, okay? And it's the lactic acid that leaks out of the cancer or the, that cancer cell that eats the neighbor and gives you all the pain. That's what it is, all right? And, and I read where in a couple studies they used what they call a low pH therapy where they fed you a bunch of glucose, IV. And then, and then that dropped the pH of the cancer cell to about four and it died. Okay. And then I read of one called the high pH therapy, which they increased the pH of the cell and it died also. Now, the reason that they use those is because, and this is the reason that chemotherapy and, and uh, radiation, this is the main reason why this is used, is because a cell undergoing fermentation produces a third as much ATP as a normal cell. So it's not as tough. It doesn't produce as much energy. 
and it doesn't produce as much energy because they can't get oxygen in there to burn the carbohydrate. In other words, you've got a rag stuck in the carburetor, and so it's going to give you a lot of black smoke coming off. Okay? So that's why chemotherapy, which is a, a uh, poison that they put in a weak enough poison that it will kill the cell that not produces as much energy, but the normal cell can withstand it. Sometimes they get a little off and it doesn't work so well, but, but that's what it's based on. All of that is based on that fact of production of ATP. Well, uh, Dr. Keith Brewer did this research using a couple mineral elements. One of them was rubidium and one of them was cesium. And if you look on a periodic table, they'll be in the first column. You know, sodium, potassium, uh, you know, rubidium, cesium, they're just right there. And they're not radioactive, although you can make them that way if you want to. And they used to use a radioactive form of cesium, but that didn't work. But the regular cesium, and what Dr. Brewer said is, we use cesium to increase the cell pH and the life of the cell will be short-lived because the pH is raising it, kills it, and that's the end of it. <coughs> okay, and, uh, and they had done studies and, you know, and, but, the, the, but the research never really went anywhere. So Dr. Brewer uh, came to University of Wisconsin Plata and my, and, and my uh, immunology bacteriology professor, Dr. Marilyn Tufty, and gave her a whole bunch of money if she would do this research. And, and he first went to the chemistry department and they just laughed at him. And the reason they laughed at him is because cesium uh, doesn't hydrolyze water, which means it, it won't cause the pH to go up. But she did it anyway, and she was very, very successful. But she tried to publish it, and nobody would take it. Well, anyway, she did get it published, and I found all this stuff, and I thought, how can I make some money? <laughs> I am. I can't do it on people. I am not a doctor. I get thrown in jail. So, so you know what I thought of? Cancer eye cows. That's a great idea. Oh, you know they give them to you. Well, and I got one with a tumor, blastoma, size of a basketball. It's huge. And I, I couldn't feed it because it didn't want to screw up the rumen. So I made a interperitoneal injection. And, you know, I just kind of coupled this together. And within three weeks, I got rid of that. Well, you know, I just assumed that's what's supposed to do. So I went back and told her. And she brought in the, the head of the department, and then they wanted me to do some more research for them. So I did. And every case, we were, uh, uh, had, almost 100% uh, repression of growth. It means if we quit using it, it would start growing again. And that, that we only did it for two or three weeks. So I don't know what happened. Now there's another part to this. You know, I, I, I'm, you know, when you do research, everything has to be constant. And one of the constants is you had to feed all the mice in all the protocols a uh, laboratory chow, uh, you know, purine laboratory chow. Everything had to be that way because it makes a standard. So I decided to make one by myself. And the only thing that I used was oats. Didn't get nothing else, no milk, just oats. Well, the one. The one with the oats had a 50% reduction in growth 
over the laboratory chow that wasn't getting anything else. Well, that means your diet is as important as whatever therapy you're taking. Okay. Well, I got to thinking, because I'm, I have good friends in the chemistry department and in the biology department, and they don't like each other, and none of them like the ag department, and, and uh, the teaching department, they, they don't exist, and the engineers, you know, nobody likes anybody at the university. I don't care what they say. So, I got to thinking, you know, what is it that seizing does? Because if you, if, let's say you had cancer, and, and uh, your, the, the, your cancer cells eating your neighbor and causing a great deal of pain. I know that if you take nine grams of cesium a day, within 24 hours, there will be no pain. None. None. That quick. I know that. I, I know some people that have used it. And within 24 hours, that's, that's solved that problem. So, and I also know some people who took it and they didn't have cancer anymore. I don't know. I don't know whether it was they were doing other, I don't know. But I, anyway, I knew that cesium couldn't hydrolyze water. And so I thought there's got to be a mechanism where the cesium is blocking the potassium, sodium potassium channel or or some, some complex thing that I don't understand. And I don't even know how to research it. But remember, I have two daughters that have PhDs in biochemistry. One of them worked at Mayo Clinic for three years on brain cancer. And so I, I, I said to them, oh, what do you think about this idea? And they would think about it, and then they'd give me a whole bunch of words I didn't know. And I said, do you think it'll work? She said, well, I, I know how to do it. So I went to the university, to Marilyn Tufty, and I said, Marilyn, would you like to have Miranda come and do research? Yeah. Oh, they went nuts. They could finally got a biochemist that would actually know how to do something, and she got the engineering department to make a, micro, a special microscope of some kind, they call it a uh, Raman microscope. No, not a noodle, uh, but uh, it's, that's what they called it. Uh, uh, and they got the chemistry department to, uh, uh, I don't know, she got them all working together to do this research. And she's going to point out the change in the pH on the inside and the outside and all the particulars. Now, if, if this kind of stuff interests you, I have a, a paper that she made up on cancer therapy, and you may take it if you wish. It's just interesting. Yes, she uses words that none of us understand, and you have to go to uh, doctor to have them tell you what the hell some of them mean. And, and, but that's just the way it is. But you sure may have one if you'd like. I'm not sure if I confused you or not, but the production of energy in the plant and the production of more production of grass where you have more tons or more animal units per acre than you ever did before, and the increase in the energy, which decreases the amount of feed an animal use, and the balance of the minerals reduces the amount of energy you do require. See how it all comes together? It's, it's all a big giant cycle, and we think we know more than the bugs do. We're way smarter. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? I, I probably ran out of stuff. So this is what that cover crop, the whole big cover crop deal, where you six, eight, ten, twelve species, 
that's what this is. It's addressing this deficiency. It's solving this problem. Yeah, don't ever have a monoculture. The more species you can have out there, the better off. And the cattle will determine which ones that you keep. If she doesn't want broom sedge, then maybe you shouldn't plant broom sedge. Of course, maybe you aren't going to anyway, but eventually those plants that they don't desire, if you graze properly and knock this stuff down, eventually they will go away. I already said that, but that broom, with that that uh, hyperania that Ian had in in Africa. I mean, it had thousands of hectares of this of these trees, and now they he hasn't hardly got any. Another other species have come and taken over. Well, who ever heard of that? He never planted any seed. The seed was already there. You just make conditions right for it to grow. Seeds put a protein layer around them and they can stay in the soil for a hundred years. Bacteria do the same thing. That's why I say the azotobacter are there, but they're just dormant because the conditions are not right for them to grow. You have to have the right amount of humidity, you have to have the right amount of, of, of uh, heat for that organism. You have to have uh, a food source for that organism. You have to have the correct pH for that organism to live. And you have to have the organism. Now the organism's there, but we just don't make it conditions right. Okay, any questions? Yes, sir. An observation. Yeah. I've uh, spent most of my life in the short grass country. My cows just couldn't understand to take uh, top part of the grass and leave the bottom. But uh, when the story is all, they take it all. Aha. <laughs> when they go into the paddock, You, you put them in the paddock when it, it, uh, it's uh, so it gets about four inches, about like this, right? Do they eat this plant, eat, eat this plant, and then go over here to the next one? Now they skip, skip. One, one bite. bite. More one than bite. Than do they eat this whole thing in one bite? Yes. Pretty close. Yes. Yes. Okay, and then the next one they'll skip? Well, uh, if they're taking this, sometimes the cow will stand, stand one spot and kind of work back and forth and then she take a step. And uh, this was when you first let them in. First let them in. And, and they, they look like a lawnmower and they go right along. No, they don't. They don't go on like a lawnmower and just one after another after another. Well, they'll take that step. They'll bite and step, bite and step, bite and step. So they're, they are skipping. Yeah. So what happens if they bite and step and bite and step and they get to the end of the paddock and you move them? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then we've got some left over, don't we? I'm getting back to the point you were talking about, the protein and the energy. Yes, sir. The energy is in the top part. Well, that cow's taking the whole, the whole leaf, so she's getting a and short to fifty of each, maybe. It, so that that could be. It can be true that it's just perfect, if, you know, in short grass. But what what I say in short grass pastures is why isn't there other species? I understand. I understand why it is now. But it can change. Uh, I I was working in this uh, 13 years, and I was getting some other grasses coming back in. But one of the problems we have in a lot of eastern Colorado and other places, we continuous grazing for many years. Yeah. Blue Bama changed from a, so, uh, a bunch grass into a sod grass. Yes. And that's it. 
that, that, that is something that maybe Elizondo thought that, you know, could be changed, but it's more of a, it might have taken 40, 50 years to change it to sod, and it's not going to come back overnight. That, I agree. I agree. It yeah, might take some more time. I thought it would. You can, you can do it, but you would probably have to increase the animal impact or the number of animals per square foot so high where they don't eat very much, but they knock more of it down. And then you could get it to change. But there's a problem. <laughs> they still got to eat something. Now, another way you could get it to change, I, I'm not suggesting, I'm just saying you could, is roll some hay out so that they don't get to eat much and the hay feeds the soil. That's another way. Can you do, I know, I mean, there's too many acres and you ain't gonna do it, and I understand it. I understand it, but understand that the more grass or more uh, material that you put down here on the soil to feed the bacteria, the more other species will start. I know it's hard. I know it may take 50 years. Just need a good hailstorm every once in a while. Well, that, that, that would do it too. Yes, sir. Uh, on your reclaiming your uh, dry farm ground that's been wore out so bad that you finally abandoned it, rolling out the hay feed in the wintertime, I mean, it's incredible. One species that you planted out there and you wind up with, that one getting better than everything gets Oh, sure. Better. It's organic matter. Right. And when you say organic matter, organic matter is what the bugs eat, and the worms, and the nematodes, and the fungi. And nobody thinks about that. You know that the grazing recommenders don't want you to feed hay on your native range because it brings in cheap grass. Okay? <laughs> yeah. This is what I mean, very famous one up well, popular one up where I'm at. Absolutely feed hay on the range land. You feed it on something they don't eat like prairie sand reed, and then you feed it in the drawers where it whatever yeah. it's gone and, and then they'll, everything down. Then then they'll graze it. Yeah, well, the energy comes back up exactly.